there you go. So welcome everybody. It's so lovely to have you here. This is actually a first where we're doing a free webinar just because I want to get this information out there. I think the more we talk about grief and mourning and the more we understand the fundamental truths of grief and mourning, um, the gentler, more compassionate communities will exist worldwide. So I'm thrilled to have representation from South Africa, from Scotland, from Ireland, from England, from Canada, and from the US. This is wonderfully international, and I'm, I'm just thrilled to have you all join me for this hour. Uh, we will keep it to an hour. As I mentioned before I started the recording, if anybody has any pressing questions, I will stay on after the hour and I'll be happy to answer any press pressing questions that you have. And please feel free to put comments in the chat box um, as we go. I may not be able to scan them all as I'm doing it in real time, but Donna will keep her eye on the chat box. She'll let me know of anything that needs addressing immediately. The other thing that, um, that will happen is I will read the chat box at the end. So if there's anything that you're asking that, uh, that I didn't cover and I see it in the chat box, I'll send you an email directly, which is part of why we have you register so that I know how to reach you afterwards. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, and there are a number of you who don't know me, my name is Maria Klyovkov. My background is um, I, I'm a master's degree in psychology, in theater arts. I have a bachelor's in psychology and theater arts and a master's degree in theater directing because who but a theater director would start a hospice. But the reality is I did start a hospice. I was the founding executive director of a hospice in rural British Columbia, Canada, many, many years ago. And while I was there, the RCMP, which is the local police, asked us to create a program for people who are grieving the loss of a loved one due to vehicular homicide or fentanyl death because that was on the uprise. So what we're talking about is traumatic grief um, and also suicide grief. And I was smart enough to know what I didn't know and to say, I'm not going there. Uh, and so what we ended up doing is the board and I decided I would put in one grant and one grant only to take the entire training by Dr. Alan Wofelt, who is a leader in North America and a male clinician whose specialty is grief. And he's now written almost 90 books. He's coming on to 90. His goal is at least 100 um, before he retires. But then he says, and I'm never going to retire. So there you have it. Um, he runs the Center for Loss and Life Transition in Colorado, and I'm just truly honored that, uh, that I had this opportunity to study with him, because what happened was the One Granting Organization is an organization for the Columbia Basin, and, um, and their goal was that I go take this training, I get my death and grief study certificate, as long as by the end of it, Dr. Wolfelt wrote a letter that said, I can now go and train other hospices. So not only because we got this grant, did I learn what I needed to learn, not just about basics of bereavement and grief, but traumatic grief and complicated grief. But then I was tasked to go out and teach other hospices. Um, eventually, it came really clear to me that this is what I was born to do and what, I'm, what I need to do, because I believe healthy communities start with people knowing how to walk the grief journey because we all have grief. We all continue to have grief, never more so than in this past year, for sure. And, um, and we don't know how to deal with it. We're not taught how to deal with it. So that's what this hour is meant to be. And we're going to use every tool I have in my toolkit to bring the information to you as gently and as clearly as possible um, so that we can start creating compassionate communities around the world. My partner in crime from my hospice days is Donna Gustafson. She's now waving to you. I'm going to ask her to come on and tell you a little bit about how she entered this whole thing. Um, but truly, she's been my partner in hospice. When I stepped down from hospice, she also left hospice. And together, it is our mission to do a healthy morning revolution where we revolutionize the way people think about grief and mourning. So Donna, I hand it over to you. Top of the morning to everybody. Welcome. Um, I I was like every like so many people I know. I was over fifty before I suffered a significant loss in my life, 
So in 2010, I started an anticipatory grief walk with my mom. And I'm using terms that I know now. I didn't know what they were then. And in October of 2010, I lost my mom. Um, she suffered a sudden and massive stroke, lost her swallow mechanism. So we had a 10 day transition as mom's body shut down. And as I entered that, mom was 90, my dad was 89 at the time. And I now had to step in and do an awful lot for my dad. So we entered into the estate stuff that needed to be handled. Two months later, I found my father-in-law deceased. So I am now segueing into another death event and impacted, families impacted. And we, in just two days before the, my death of my father-in-law, I had to do step into a major family intervention for a loved family member. So after the funeral of my father-in-law in January of 2011, I had no shortage of things to occupy my time. And I just soldiered on. I just bucked up and got to it and did all sorts of wonderful things. And in 2014, my husband and I made the move permanently out to our family cabin in Windermere. 2015, I stepped into the doors of the hospice office and met Maria. And I was sure that my calling was to work in a hospice in some way, shape or form. I took the end of life, uh, the end of life training first and then right back to back, I went into the bereavement training. And in that bereavement training, light bulbs are popping on. And all of a sudden I realized what my last five years had been like. It was gray. It was very little color. Joy was forced. There was nothing, nothing. It was busy and I kept busy, but a lot of stuff had been missing. And I remember day three of our training and my head is on the table and I'm just whacking my forehead. And Maria said, what are you doing? I said, I've got buried and carried grief. Like, boom, all of a sudden there it was in my face. And I, the, the beauty of working with Marie inside the hospice office at that point as a volunteer was I had access to her all the time. So that was a blessing on my part. But what I have come to understand since then, and I've had about seven losses, major losses since then, with close family members, my dad, um, I handle this differently. My, my grief journey is very different for all of these losses since I've had that opportunity to be with Maria. I've also come to realize this is not a one event. This is, this is an ongoing progressive event. We were so blessed to have family that lives so long into their seventies and their eighties and their nineties that they all kind of, we lost them all in a fairly short period of time, but I was over 50 and I had no knowledge. My, my family never talked about death. I didn't even know my grandparents had died until I saw flowers in the house. So I had no exposure. And I've, I've come to realize that what Maria is creating is an amazing landing pad for people to come to understand what their grief journey can be, what it can look like, and how you can smooth edges out. So, you know, for those of us that are old enough to remember the Remington commercial where the guy says, I liked it so much about the company, that's kind of where I got to when Maria approached me and said, I would really, you know, I'd really like you to join forces with me and let's do some work. So here I am. So thank you. I am deeply appreciative that you all have taken an hour out of your Saturday to join us. Thank you, Donna. That was beautiful. And we're all blessed by you joining us in this. Um, so I see some of you grabbing your mugs and your water. Excellent. In my email to you, I reminded you. Um, one of the things that happens, yeah, raise those mugs. One of the things that happens in grief is that we get dehydrated. It's one of the physical symptoms of grief that is really prevalent. So I encourage every time I'm on any kind of webinar or, or any kind of uh, Facebook Live, I encourage if you see me drinking, that's an invitation and a reminder to you to drink as well. So hopefully you all have your glasses of water. Um, and what I am going to do now is I'm going to share my screen and we're gonna get this party started. So 
Can you all see my screen? Thumbs up? Yes? Uh-huh. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start with, actually, let me do it this way. Let me go screenshare from the beginning. Okay. That should be nice and big for you now. Okay. Can you all see it? We're good? Excellent. Um, I'll just give you a second to take a look at this little comic strip. It's one that I love because it reminds us, as Donna so eloquently put it, she was 50 years old before she um, experienced a death in her family. We live in the first grief-free generation. It's thanks to all the medical advances, but the reality is, um, whereas grief used to be just a part of life, and when we were 10, when we were 12, when we were 20, we had people in our family who we loved die and we understood that it was a natural progression. The reality is now most people don't know what grief is about. And so you get this kind of response of, oh, get over it. And then all of a sudden the person who's saying get over it is the one who's completely lost. And the one who had grief and did not get the support they needed from their loved one um, says, I thought you had no patience for grief. And then this one person says, what I think we all fundamentally know to be true, it is different when it is your own. And until we've experienced it, we really just don't know. And so part of that tasks the person who is grieving with some grace that we can extend to those who really don't get it. They really don't understand. However, when we're in the grief journey, it's really important that we surround ourselves with people who do get it, who make space and grace for our grief journey because usually what we're experiencing is all kinds of buck up and move on messages. And these are thanks to um, Dr. Alan Wolfelt. These are ones that he identifies. Keep busy. Raise your hand if you've heard this or any one of them. Keep busy. You have an angel in heaven. Yeah, I see those hands going up. Be glad you had him or her for as long as you did. Keep your chin up. Well, you know, Dr. Wofeld has been teasing that his next book is going to be True, Not Helpful. <laughs> and that's going to be the title of his book. And I really, I'm really hoping he writes that book because the reality is while some of these are complete misinformation, something like you have an angel in heaven may be true, but at this moment in time, it's not helpful because I want that angel here next to me. So it's just not helpful in the grief journey. Move on messages you may have heard that, uh, that may sound familiar to you, and you may have said them. If you've said these, please know when we know better, we do better. This is all part of the myths that we're going to debunk here because we don't want to be spreading misinformation. This isn't going to bring them back. You need to seek closure. We're going to talk about that one in a minute. Be strong. Time heals all wounds. Time does not heal the wound of grief. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about that in the upcoming live launch. Uh, but that's one of the myths that, that really we need to stop saying altogether. And we need to understand why it's not true. Most of all, you need to seek closure. If you have anybody telling you that, and if you are thinking that yourself, please know that is a fundamental not truth because seeking closure suggests that the relationship has ended. And this is the fundamental truth. Death ends a life, but it does not end a relationship. This wisdom comes from an American philosopher in the early 1930s, Robert Woodruff Anderson. You may have heard it couched in Mitch Albom's word, words, death ends a life, not a relationship. Mitch Albom is the gentleman who wrote Tuesdays with Maury. His teacher and philosopher, Maury Schwartz, is the one who was quoting Robert Woodruff Anderson. And Jack Lemmon, when he played the character, Maury Schwartz, um, and he was asked on screen of everything that you've learned about this person and his thoughts and his wisdom, what do you take away? And for Jack Lemmon, it was death ends a life, not a relationship. So sometimes Jack's the one who's credited with the quote. Sometimes it's Mitch Album. This is the origins of the quote. Why does this matter to us? Because it's a fundamental truth. Death has ended the life of your beloved. And the grief journey is about coming to reconciliation with that fundamental truth. 
But the only way we come to reconciliation with that is if we start finding where the relationship sits now. And so this common myth that we need to seek closure actually blocks the grief journey. It denies what the grief journey is designed to do. The grief journey is designed to help you find where the relationship is now so that you can move forward with your life. The grief process is just that. It is a natural living process, just like the death process. When I was in hospice and Donna made reference to the end of life training, death is the, is the last of the living processes. Grief journey is a living process and it is a sacred one, but it is made not sacred by people who spread misinformation about the need for closure or severing the relationship. So if you hear that, and if you take nothing else away from today, please, please, please hear this fundamental truth and, and honor that this is true and that my job now and every part of my grief journey is asking me to do this. And we're going to talk about the symptoms of grief and how they ask you to do this. But every part of your grief journey is pointing you towards finding where the relationship is now so that you can begin to let go of the physical. And if you're in the middle of your grief journey, you may have already been releasing a lot of the physical connections with your loved one made so much easier when you find where the relationship is now. So the grief process is a slow process that moves at the speed of the griever. I cannot stress this enough. It moves at your pace. When you are the griever, your body, your mind, your heart, and your soul are working in tandem to move through this process. Dr. Wofelt uses the term perturbation. Perturbation is a natural constriction and release and constriction and release. Think about your intestines, right? And how it processes food, constriction and release, constriction and release, and it moves it through your body. There's a natural perturbation to grief. Everybody's is unique. So it's always at the speed of the griever. The griever moves at their own speed. So if you are fresh in your grief, you take from this what you can, you let go of the rest. You don't worry about trying to move at the pace I'm going with this. You let the information that's important for you today right now come, and you trust that when you need to hear the next piece, the next piece will be there for you. No two grief processes are alike. So even if it's the same person experiencing many different griefs, Donna alluded to her griefs. The reason I, I went full in on the bereavement grief process is because between 2010 and 2020, while I was working at the hospice, I, I lost 10 people and 10 significant people, the closest people in my world. 10, during that 10 year process, I'm sorry, I didn't lose 10. I lost seven during that process. I've lost 10 since 2010 because um, in the last year, in fact, Tuesday, May 4th will be the one year anniversary of the first of three close family members who died. So it's been 10 losses for me in a very short period of time. Um, no two grief processes are alike. No two of those 10 can I point to and say, yeah, that's the same as that, or that's the same as that. And no two people are alike, even if you've lost the same type of relationship. So if you've both lost spouses and maybe you both lost them to the same type of illness, those two grief process will still be completely different. It's always about the speed of the griever that we move at. Um, grief produces symptoms on five levels, physical symptoms, and I'm sure we've all experienced physical symptoms of grief, whether it's back aches, whether it's skin irritation, whether <clears throat> it's aches and pains. Um, for me, it's my joints. My joints just get hammered with grief. Um, it can be eye issues. It can be hearing issues. It can be tear, like water just dropping out of your eyes or eye twitches. There's a whole myriad of physical symptoms, including nausea, all, all manner of things. There are mental symptoms of grief, confusion, um, can't put two thoughts together. It makes sense that we would have mental symptoms of grief because the reality is when we're, when we're first faced with a loss, part of what we're faced with is where are they now? And 10% of our brain is working on where are they now? Where are they now? Where are they now? And it's working on it 24 seven. 
So of course, we're going to have physical symptoms of exhaustion because we're not getting rest because our brain is working constantly. Um, and just like a computer, if 10% of your computer is working on downloading something, you know that the computer moves slower. With 10% of your brain working on this one problem of where are they now, of course, you're going to be thinking slower. Of course, you're going to be confused. Of course, you're not going to, your brain's not going to be moving at the pace you're used to. And that's going to cause a lot of frustration. I just speak from personal experience. Anybody else experience anything of what I'm talking about? Or am I just talking in a vacuum here? Yeah. Okay. I'm seeing some hands go up, right? There are emotional symptoms of grief, right? And, and they run the gamut and they run the gamut from blame, shame, guilt, um, uh, confusion, uh, sorry, not confusion, frustration, anger, disappointment, hurt, pain, um, all, all the gamuts, but it also includes joy. When we remember something that we have forgotten for decades and suddenly we feel a moment of joy or elation, that too can be part of a grief symptom. Social symptoms of grief, people moving away, um, people who we thought would be right there with us, but suddenly they're not there and they move away and, and they see us coming from down the street and they actually turn and walk away. That's a secondary loss. All of those people in our family, we thought that this would bring the family together, but instead the death was like a bomb in the family. And by bomb, I mean B-O-M-B, -B, not the B-A-L-M that we were hoping it would be. But it's because everybody grieves differently. Suddenly we, we're lost and we don't have the social support that we thought maybe we would have. And finally, spiritual symptoms of grief. We ask the hard questions. We might experience that we're angry at God and we never thought we would hit that place. And we're not even sure that it's okay for us to be angry at God. How can we possibly allow that to be? So there are some very deep dark nights of the soul that are part of the grief journey and they are a natural part of the grieving process. This is the part we need to understand. All of this is the natural grief process, and it's meant to forge who we are to become, right? The grief process ensures that we will never be the person we were before the person died. And we long to be that again, because we long to have that person. And we're in a place that Dr. Wofelt refers to as betwixt and between, where we're not the person that we were, and we can't even imagine the person we're becoming, we're lost and we're feeling lost. Most of us will experience feeling lost during this time period, and that's okay. The challenge is most of us have not allowed ourselves, and certainly our society has not given us the space or the grace to be lost for a while. So over time, the symptoms that I just described do soften when grief is converted to mourning. And most of us use the terms grief and mourning interchangeably. So I'm gonna be really clear about what the distinction between the two are. But the challenge is to allow ourselves to feel the grief and to convert it to mourning because with that, symptoms will soften. If they don't, then we have a different experience. That's buried and carried grief. Donna alluded to it. I will speak about that as well in a minute. The grief journey is a sacred one. Here's the key to the puzzle. The grief journey is a sacred one. And when it is done well, we can find joy. And you don't need to take my word for it. We have a lovely person in our program, Susie. Um, and Susie was really sorry that she couldn't be here right now. I'm gonna tell you where she is right now so that we can all send her and her daughter some love. Her beautiful mom has been in a nursing home in upstate New York and she has not been allowed to see her for a year and a half. And today is the day that she and her daughters are going to visit. So for those of you on the call who know Susie, please send her lots of special love. Um, Donna, I'm going to ask you to read the beautiful testimonial. And one of the reasons I'm not reading it is because when I read it the first time, I cried. I just, it, it touched my heart so deeply. So I'm going to ask Donna if, Donna, you would please Certainly. read it for us. My pleasure. Um, HR, HMR testimonial. When I saw, suddenly lost my husband last October 13th, 2020 of a massive heart attack, I was absolutely devastated. He was my best friend. He was only 54. I was not in a good place mentally. I tried to get into a local grief counselor for help. 
They told me it would be a three to four month wait because of the issues of COVID in the community. When the darkness of winter set in, my mental health took a very bad turn for the worst. I started da going down a dark, dark, deep hole of depression and suicidal thoughts started to come. I knew I needed help and fast. I didn't know where to turn. By happenstance, I came upon the HMR group and Maria on Facebook. I thought I was going crazy. I had six kids and nine grandkids to live for. I took her five day live launch session. I was invited to go deeper into my grief studies and understanding in weekly online classes and Q and A sessions. Immediately, I was comforted by Maria's soft, kind voice. I was enthralled at her knowledge of grief and what happens to our bodies and minds when we grieve. I had ordered many grief books off Amazon and I just couldn't read and concentrate. At that time, the books were of no help. I was invited to join the group on a more permanent basis. I was concerned I couldn't financially swing it even though it's an awesome price for all of the knowledge, care and concern you receive. My husband left me with lots of debt, no will or life insurance. Mentally, he was having a hard time with brain dementia as well. Those five days helped me so much, I decided to have faith to take the plunge. It's the best money I've ever spent. I've since gone into counseling locally and a few other grief programs in my community. But nothing helps me more than HMR. I look forward to the weekly sessions and the monthly Q&A Zoom sessions are invaluable. Mentally, I am so much better. I'm starting, really starting to understand grief better and I realize I can embrace it, feel it and let it out. I'm not crazy, I'm just grieving deeply and that's okay. I can't stress enough how this program is more than worth every penny you invest in it. Please consider truly learning the truth about grief from someone who has been there many times and has been trained to help others like me. This program is a very huge blessing in my life and heart. I'm starting to smile and feel a lightness of heart with all that I've learned thus far. I can't wait to learn more on my healing journey of grief. Please take advantage of this program. I've committed to at least a year with Maria and HMR will probably extend from there. Thank you. Sincerely, Susie Tenas, Potsdam, New York. Thanks, Donna. Most welcome. What touches me about that is I'm not crazy. I'm just deeply grieving. But how many of us think that we're crazy when we're going through this? It's because nobody is normalizing the symptoms of grief. Nobody is saying it's not unusual that you would feel that way. So, so to hear Susie say that just so warmed my heart. And for her to say that she's even experiencing a little joy, because in honesty, October is not that long ago. And, and I remember when she first came to us. And you may have heard her say, I'm committed to one year. This is the first I've heard of that. I don't make a requirement for anybody to be committed for any extended period of time. Your grief journey is your grief journey. You'll know when you need what you need. And I completely trust that. But here's the thing, that, that she's found that depth of value around it and that she's found her fundamental truth. That's the key. So if anybody is ever telling you what you should be doing in your grief journey, run and run fast because the reality is only you know what you need to be doing in order to achieve what Susie's already achieved and is continuing to achieve. So just love and blessings to you, Susie. Thank you so much for that. That just warms my heart. So let's define some of these terms that we've been using. Bereavement, when we say somebody is bereaved, what we mean is that they have been torn apart. To be bereaved is to be torn apart and to have special needs because of that being torn apart. When a death happens, particularly the death of somebody close to you, you are being torn apart. And if you have any buried and carried grief, if you have any grief from a past loss that you have not experienced, it's coming up too because grief awaits welcome. It's awaiting that moment, right? Because grief does not go away with time. 
that's the great myth. It's awaiting the opportunity. Grief is a constellation of inner symptoms experienced when we lose somebody or something near and dear to us. So first and foremost, grief is not an emotion in and of itself. Grief is a constellation of a hundred different emotions. Plus it's a constellation of the mental symptoms I pointed to, the physical symptoms I pointed to, the social and spiritual symptoms I pointed to. It's a constellation and your constellation is completely unique to you. Mourning is what happens when we give an external expression to our inner experience. So grief happens internally to us. Mourning is what happens when we let it out. So when somebody is crying or keening, um, we say they are mourning, rightly so, because what we're experiencing is that external expression of their grief. Okay, that's an important distinction because remember I said, the key to healing really is in converting the grief to mourning. It's one thing to know this stuff intellectually, but among the 10 people who died in the last 11 years of my life, my beloved mother died in 2017. And so I wrote a love letter to my mom. This is the love letter. It's healthy morning, happy loving, 52 ways to convert your grief to mourning with ease and grace, because now suddenly I needed to find my own practices. I needed to find my own way of doing this. And what I realized is um, it would be helpful to others to know how to do this. But as we heard from Susie, you know, it's, it's not easy to read a book when you're in this place. And I knew that all too well. So what I did was I created a book that's literally two pages each chapter. The page is a paragraph of explanation, a paragraph uh, explanation of the conversion technique, a paragraph that is about how I utilize that conversion technique in um, the grief with my mother or my father or my godparent or my aunt. And I speak very personally the story of it. And then the next page is getting started. And it's just ideas because it doesn't matter how I did it. That might give you some ideas. What's important is how do you do it? And so you want the bullet point of ideas so that you can just open the book to wherever you need it and you find what you need. Or you go to the chart at the back of the book that says, oh, I've got a mental symptom of grief. Let me see which conversion technique might I use for this. So in the book, um, in the very beginning where I define the difference between grief and mourning, I'm going to need to get my glasses here. And of course, my glasses fell down. So here we go. Um, what I say in the book, in the introduction is this book is focused on converting grief to mourning. In other words, we consciously work to shift the internal experience into an external expression that releases the symptoms from our body, mind, heart, and soul. So I just want you to feel that in your body for a minute. Can you feel what it would be like if you could find the tool that you need in the moment that you need it to release what's ever going on inside of you? And you don't have to worry about tomorrow or next week or even next hour. It's just in this moment in time. The healthy morning revolution is all about, let me identify what's going on in my grief journey right now and let me be willing to convert it and let me find the tool that is most effective in this moment in time for me to be able to do that, okay? Uh, it is an act, it is in the act of conversion that we begin to accept our new reality. So remember I said that ultimately the grief process is all about reconciling with this new reality that our loved one is no longer part of our physical presence. But it is also about finding the relationship. And that's what mourning allows us to do. It allows us to find where the relationship is now. So it is in the act of conversion that we begin to accept our new reality. It is in the reconciliation with the new reality that true healing occurs. And it's not a one and done. It, it absolutely isn't a one and done. It's an ongoing journey. 
However, for people who say that, you know, I will grieve for the rest of my life, there are two types of people who say that. There are the people who say, I will grieve for the rest of my life. I need to be sad because I owe it to my loved one to be in the sadness. Otherwise, our love, it didn't mean as much to me. And it's, it's a false loyalty to do it that way. The other way to do it is to say, I am really going to claim where the relationship is now, and I'm going to celebrate that relationship. So when I have grief bursts because a song comes on the radio and it takes me back to a moment in time with my loved one who's no longer in my physical presence, yeah, there may be tears, but there's also going to be great joy and a whole lot of gratitude for having had that time with this precious person. And I have my mother looking at me as I'm saying this, right? This precious person gave me so much. How wonderful it is that I can now celebrate her life and not be stuck in a place in grief, but rather I've moved through the grief by converting it to mourning. So the importance of converting grief to mourning is that it empowers the bereaved. It empowers the person who is feeling torn apart and who needs, who has special needs because mourning gives you what you need in those special moments. Mourning gives you exactly what you need so that you're not feeling lost and hopeless. You're actually feeling empowered to move through the grief journey. And um, it prevents buried and carried grief, you know? And part of what the book does is that it gives you, I'm just going to go back to the slide of the um, book for a second, because part of what the book does with the 52 ways to convert your grief to mourning is it gives you a whole spectrum of possibilities. And we also have a healthy mourning program where we go through a different conversion technique literally every single day, uh, sorry, every single week. We, we meet once a week and every week we go through one of the chapters and then we brainstorm ideas of how to approach this. And Joe, I know you've been part of this uh, group for a while now, and I know that you're working with some really deep losses. Like you, I'm a womb twin. And for those who don't know, we can talk about that later, what a womb twin is. Um, but Joe, if you could just talk for a second, because I know for you, um, you had this wonderful phrase, which said that our meeting times are <laughs> as important as doctor's appointments to you. So I'd just love for you to speak to that for a minute, if you would. Yeah, um, well, I, I met Maria through the Womb Twin uh, group and um, I, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I was kind of like a, a person drowning, hanging on to something that might give me a bit of hope and light. And in that group, I found that Maria was you were very clear and patient and timely didn't quite even understand the timing, but you were clear and patient. And you talked about grief and buried grief and all these terminologies, which I, I didn't know. And then it, I began to realize that I was carrying an awful lot of stuff that had gone on maybe 20, 30 years. And you know, I, I felt like there's a, an image I have of the, the film from The Mission when Robert De Niro was climbing up that mountain with all his armour on. I, I, I kind of got a feeling, that's me. I'm carrying a load of stuff and I don't know how to get rid of it. And how did it get there? Stuck to me as well. And in, in many ways, uh, that's what I've been doing with Maria. I never realised that I had it. I had it. It was experiencing anxiety, it was experiencing insomnia, panic attacks, but I never knew that grief could cause any of that. I felt that my mind was one big yarn of wool, totally entangled, and no one was helping me unthread it. And that's why I say the patience of, of Maria to take maybe one thread, we'll just go one at a time, <laughs> one thread, and, and make sense of it. And eventually, you know, the next thread and the next thread, one strand at a time. And um, I find that the, the group I joined, I joined the Healthy Morning Revolution. And I too, every week, I look forward to it. I, won't, I don't miss it. I can't miss it, won't miss it. It's so important to my life. And the feeling of, well-being that I get, it, 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 it's 
helps me move forward, helps me understand, and helps me at a deeper level where no one else has really got there before, but like the Heineken advert. But it's it's um, been the most significant help every week going through a different conversion technique. One really, one or two really, it gets you right there, but eventually you go back and say, oh, wow, I can use this one now. So you have a wealth of information stored. So for me, it's been a blessing and it is as vital as the doctor's appointments or anything else. So it helps me move and live again, have a bit of joy and not have to carry that burden that I didn't even know was carrying, but was killing me. It was literally killing me. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Maria and Donna and the rest of the group who we share with so deeply. It gives me meaning to share at a lovely depth as well. That that helps my soul and spirit as well as anything else. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Joe, it is so lovely to have you in the group. And um, thank you for that image of the pulling of the threads, because you're right. It's it's just let me be with the thread that's in front of me right now. Let me not worry about that whole ball of yarn, because I can get overwhelmed with that really quickly. And uh, overwhelm is part of that grief journey. So when we talk about buried and carried grief and catch up mourning, you know, I love this picture of buried and carried grief, except for I don't know if you can relate to this, but when I saw it and it's a backpack, well, it would be lovely if I could just kind of take the backpack off. But the reality is it doesn't live as a backpack. It lives in my gut. That's where I experience it. It lives in my belly and in my gut. And it's as heavy as that backpack. And I feel the weight of it when I'm bearing and carrying grief. Carrying grief. So buried and carried grief can really just take you out, as Joe said, so eloquently, it really takes you out physically. Because remember, I said, when you convert grief to mourning, um, it's the grief symptoms soften. But what happens if you don't convert grief to mourning? What happens if you ascribe to the time will heal this, I just have to get busy, all of those buck up messages that we talked about? What happens if we actually take that advice? Is that those grief symptoms harden over time. And as Joe said, then some serious physical ailments start happening because grief will await welcome. It's not going to wait time, which means it's going to get buried and carried somewhere in your body and your body has to carry that load and it becomes exhausting. And slowly over time, our life spark dims as Donna pointed out, you know, I was kind of forcing having some joy in those five years, but I wasn't really having any joy. Um, and so how do we find our authentic joy is by making sure that we do the catch up morning that we need to do, because when somebody is ready to do catch up morning, the really good news is it's always there for you because grief awaits welcome, not time. So when we say I'm ready to do this work, the next thing that happens is that we are now available to process and convert the grief that we've been carrying into mourning. And as Joe said, it's one strand at a time. We slowly unfold the whole thing. Sharon, I know you also had um, some buried and carried grief that you've been playing with. Do you want to share a little bit of your story? Yes, thank you. I actually, I just wrote, I, I wrote the things out because I thought it, I didn't want to leave anything out and wanted to make it quite succinct. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read from what I've written. So my mom passed away 16 years ago and we were very close and I felt like the foundations had been pulled out from underneath me. As Maria said, felt completely lost. Um, my, da my dad passed away eight years later and it felt completely different. Um, for a very long time I experienced discomfort in my chest and always wondered whether this had something to do with not having processed my grief from my mom passing away properly and never really connected with her properly. Um, I had processed some of the grief, but I'm not sure that I knew where our relationship was now. And I also felt guilty not feeling the sadness as I felt that I was abandoning her. So I just kept con connecting with her with just with sadness. 
so I wasn't really moving through it. Um, my beloved dog passed away in September last year at 15 years of age, and this was around the time I came across Maria and the Healthy Morning launch. I felt very directed to join this, but was undecided. However, kept on getting a nudge, which I subsequently felt had come from my mom. I was fairly busy at the time and only came in on day three, but quickly did a catch up of the previous days. And as soon as I started, I realized that this was exactly what I needed to do. Maria's dulcet and soothing tones together with her compassion made me feel that this would be a very safe place to explore this deep journey, despite the pain that it might bring along with it. I somehow felt I was in safe hands. I very quickly realized that I needed to sign up to the Healthy Morning Group to follow this process through. And I cannot tell you the immense gratitude I feel for having done this. Grief is something we are never taught about how to handle, and yet every single one of us will keep experiencing this in some form throughout our lives. So I feel that it is almost imperative to have the tools to deal with this. I love the weekly sessions as it keeps me focused and grounded and constantly inviting us to look into how else we can move through our grief to find where our relationship with our loved ones now lies. I feel it is more than just dealing with grief as it equips you to, to, to learn how to deal with your emotions, to have compassion for yourself and others and to honor your journey. Maria's recounting of her own stories through, through this is very heartwarming, authentic, and I never feel like we are put into a situation that is challenging, but rather encouraged to, to challenge ourselves gently through this. Not even really challenge ourselves, but actually makes us want to do the things she's suggesting. It is lovely having a supporting group to bounce things off and share the journey with as well. I love the idea that if and when we get stuck, we are able to schedule private one-to-one -one sessions to enable us to move through this. And speaking from experience, I've had the private sessions, which have been hugely beneficial. One of the best things uh, for me is that I'm, I now no longer fear grief. Um, after having been through the grief of my mom, I, I thought, how am I ever going to cope with going through something else again? When I feel pain in my heart now, I now no longer want to run from it, which I always did, which was to get busy. But I'm able to listen to what the pain tells me and can move through it and let it pass out of me. I cannot recommend more highly a better way to invest some time and money, which in my experiences has definitely yielded huge results and continues to. So I thank you, Maria, Donna, and the group which has been really great. Sharon, thank you so much for that. That was so beautiful. And, and I love that you mentioned your precious, precious, precious puppy. I, I think of him as a puppy. Um, and, and, you know, so often we have what's called disenfranchised griefs where the rest of society, the people in our closest circles don't recognize how important this particular loss is to us. But often our, our four-leggeds and two-leggeds and winged friends are the ones who know us the best. And, and so how, how wonderful that you were able to mention him in honor. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Pleasure. And thank you for bringing it full circle because you, you said what Donna said earlier about now I don't need to fear grief anymore. And when the next loss happens... I, I know how to engage with the process. And that's really the key of all of this. So in case you've been wondering, what is this live launch that people have been talking about? It's five days, Monday through Friday. Um, we've changed up the time of it this, this time. We're, we're just trying something. It's gonna be a little later in the day in North America. Unfortunately, that puts it in, in England and Europe into the wee hours of the morning. So it's going to be 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time, which I think ends up being 8, 9, 10, 12, 1, 1 a.m. England time, 2 a.m. Um, in, in Europe. But here's the thing. We, we now welcome our Australian friends in because this becomes a time that's more doable for them. But here's the thing. As Sharon so eloquently said, she came in in day three and she caught up with the videos you can do it just on video. You don't have to be there live. And even if you have questions, that's okay. 
because what happens is we do one hour a day, we videotape it, we put it on Facebook, but if you're not on Facebook, we've now created a classroom where you can go through the videos on the classroom as well. So whether you wanna do it via Facebook or a different way, that either way is perfectly fine. Um, and so it's five hours, one hour a day, five days, Monday through Friday. Um, we talked about the time zones, the topics we include, we go really deep into buried and carried grief and the questions that come of buried and carried grief. We talk about all of the myths of grief, not just the two that I've mentioned just now. Um, and we do a lot of grief busting because not only do we look at the grief, but we er, at the myth, but we look at why is it a myth? Why has society picked up on these myths? And when we're confronted with it and we're in the middle of our grief, you know, we don't necessarily feel like teaching other people. What can we say just to free ourselves from the person who's carrying that myth and make choice as to whether it's a moment for us to help educate or it's a moment for us to just go, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to deal with this my way, right? So that we are always giving ourselves the space and grace that we need in our grief journey, because that's the most important oxygen mask on yourself first. We talk about the wellness team. Um, and how to build a wellness team around you so that you know that the people around you are the people who will help you in your grief journey and how to listen for who are the people who, who you need around you. And on Thursday of the five days, that's just a complete Q&A. And we're never at a shortage for, for questions and answers. In fact, um, this will be the seventh live launch. And ever since, I think, the second live launch, um, we, we make the weekend if we need to add special topics. So for instance, if we have a whole bunch of questions on one particular topic, then we might say, you know what, we're going to make this a special topics for Saturday. And then we do an added bonus session. And usually we add on a Saturday and sometimes it's both a Saturday and a Sunday, all dependent on the questions that are coming in. Um, we also do bonus giveaways. I do giveaways of the book. I do giveaways of pins. Every day we have a giveaway. And, and to qualify for the giveaway, all you need to do is the homework, which is really easy. Right, gang? Joe, Sharon? The homework is pretty self-explanatory. It's relatively easy. Yeah, I'm seeing the thumbs up. Um, because the reality is in the homework, um, that's where you're going to begin to hear your own answers. To hear my answers, that's the booby prize. I can give you kind of the bigger picture of where you're wanting to look, as Sharon so eloquently put it, but it's going to be up to you to actually look, to actually hear what your answers to the questions are and what you want to do. Um, so it's five days, it's five hours, and it's 50 US dollars. So you couldn't ask for a better price than that, really. Um, I'm sure Donna is putting up the registration link in the chat box. If you want to know how to get a hold of any of this, um, the book, I'm sure Donna put up the Amazon link for the book when I was talking about the book. But if you want to know how to get to the book, if you want to know how to get to the um, live launch registration or how to book a half hour talk with me privately, um, all you need to do is go to healthymorning.com. So it's all one word, www.healthymorning.com, and you will find me, and you will find us. So with that, that actually completes the PowerPoint. So I'm going to do a stop share so that we can all see each other again. And um, Donna, was there anything that came through in the chat box? Does anybody have any questions or, or um, something that's happening in your own life that will, that, that I can shed some light on. Crystal, it's good to see you here. Hello. Hello, Krista. Nice to see you as well. Um, so if you have questions, just let me know. Uh, I, I'm not seeing the feed on the chat box. So Don, if there's anything in there, you need to let me know. I think my computer is just taking a slow time with the end of the share here. So does that mean we're good? We don't have any questions? So just show of hands, how many people heard something they've never heard before today? A couple of you, yeah. Oh, even some of you in the group, excellent. 
that's always my goal is that that somehow we hear something fresh or something new. And even if it's old information, it's said in a new way so that I can hear it at a deeper level. Because that's really what the grief journey does, right? The grief journey is asking us to go deeper. The grief journey is asking us to be heard. Because again, when we talk about grief and mourning and converting grief to mourning, in order to be able to do that, we have to be willing to get present to our grief. We have to be willing to ask the all important question, where are things now for me? What, what am I really feeling about this? What's really going on? And most of us won't ask that question and I'll tell you why. Because most of us are terrified if we ask that question, our grief is gonna take us out. We've been bearing and carrying it for so long that if I dare to ask myself that question, or if I'm fresh in my grief and I dare to ask myself that question, I'll start crying and I will never stop. I will lose who I am and I'll never get her back or I'll never get him back. And then I'll lose all traction in my life. So this is a good news, bad news moment for you because um, the bad news is there is truth in, I will never get back the person I was when the person I loved was still physically in my life. The good news is I'm going to discover a me I never knew possible when I start to open to where the relationship is now. But that requires the grief journey because it requires the willingness to see the unforgiveness places and to bring gentleness and compassion to those places. It requires that in the string that's right in front of me, and Joe, thank you for this image because it's so powerful, right? Um, when, when I follow the string that's right in front of me, then I can trust that I will be given what I need to handle this moment in time. That's the grief journey. And then I'll be given the next piece. Every symptom of grief, if you think about all of your symptoms of grief, whether it's uh, back pain, uh, it's, it's frustration, it's aggravation because I can't put two and two together, it's um, losses of other people around me who I thought I could lean on, what does all of that require us to do? It requires us to slow down. The grief journey asks you, please, please, please slow down, slow your roll, because you need to slow down enough so that you're slowing to the pace of your own grief. And when you start to hear what that pace is, you start to discover how to convert that moment to mourning and then how to convert the next to mourning and so on, and so on, and so on. So I invite you to join us in the live launch to really explore this at a deeper level. Um, and uh, Crystal, I see that you have a question here. I also see we're coming to the end of the hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the, the video, the recording on this so that we can have kind of a conversation and, uh, and not be recorded around it. I do invite all of you to join us in the live launch if you need to go, because I know we're at the end of the hour, then just thank you so much for sharing this hour with us. And, um, and yeah, you're so welcome. And I will answer the questions that I'm now seeing popping up in the chat box. So to those of you who need to leave us, much love to you and ease and grace in your grief journey, truly converting your grief to mourning. That is what creates the ease and grace because you're no longer fighting your grief. And when you're no longer fighting your grief, what ends up happening is you can move through it with a remarkable amount of grace. Much love to you all. I'm going to stop the recording, but I'm going to stay on and I'm going to answer these questions. So if you just hang on two seconds. Here we go.